Hello. We are in the best of the day program summarizing the best abstracts in melanoma that have been presented in the 2015 uh, annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology of ASCO. I'm here with uh, my colleague uh, Thara Gandahar. She's assistant professor uh, of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we've been excited with all of the new advances in the field uh, of melanoma that have been shared in this meeting. Actually, the, the melanoma sessions have been overcrowded again. They had to have breakout rooms for them, so the, the excitement and the advances are continuing. But I think by far the most important one is the plenary session presented by, by Jed Walchok on a randomized trial of a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, a CD4 and a PD-1 antibody versus the individual therapies, ipilimumab or nivolumab. Tara, can you tell me about that? Absolutely. So this was a randomized phase three study comparing either ipilimumab and nivolumab or nivolumab alone to single agent ipilimumab. It po was powered to detect a difference between ipilimumab and either the combination or nivolumab. And what we saw were incredibly high response rates in both the nivolumab alone arm and the nivolumab and ipilimumab arms compared to ipilimumab with a response rate of 57% for the combination, really groundbreaking, 43% uh, with nivolumab alone compared to 19% with an ipilimumab. And along with that, a uh, significant improvement in progression-free survival in the combination or the nivo comparing, uh, containing arm compared to ipilimumab. This was not a, a report of overall survival, but it'll be very exciting to see with a little bit longer follow-up what is the overall survival benefit of the combination um, compared to ipilimumab. And of course, you know, there was a numeric comparison between nivolumab and the combination, and I certainly think the combination is a very active strategy. Um, I think it's a little bit early to say whether that should be the approach for all patients, but it's certainly an active regimen that can be considered. Uh, the toxicity was manageable in all three arms. Of course, we have to mention that the grade three and four toxicity was quite high with the combination. And so that's a factor that the clinicians have to take into consideration also when determining what combination or strategy is best for the patients. So there was a, an interesting session uh, that looked at patients' biopsies and uh, trying to understand why we have these responses to PD-1 blockade. And that may help us in discerning should every patient receive the combination of PD-1 and CTLA-4. Right. Uh, with ep -Nibo, we ex expect that it should be available and it's already, a, there's a, an expanded access program open in many sites and uh, being rebuilt by the Food and Drug Administration. But I think in the near future, we'll be able to select patients and, and decide which ones may be better served by single agent or, or double therapy. In these regards, we had uh, information about analysis of biopsies of patients who received pembrolizumab. Uh, and th the, those biopsies were analyzed by a platform that allowed to analyze 600 immune genes, uh, the, the expression of 600 immune genes, and that allowed to, uh, to define baseline signatures that are related to the production of interferon within the tumor that enrich for patients who respond. This information goes along with uh, information that was shared by Tom Gajewski and colleagues uh, about the difference between inflamed and non-inflamed melanoma, where the inflamed ones are more likely to have T cells that are ready to go and you only need to take out their break with PD-1 blockade, or the non-inflamed ones where you probably need a combination of immunotherapies to, to get that to, to, to work. Um, the, this also ties with another one of the presentations that we had, which is, as we know, these immunotherapies can bring those T cells in. Uh, the assessment of responses is a little bit difficult. Uh, and uh, Jed Wolchok presented a large series trying to look at uh, this, the phenotype of a, the, um, the, what we call pseudoprogression that mm -hmm. has been described for a long time for, with ipilimumab, where sometimes measurements of tumors may be bigger at a certain point and then they respond uh, uh, later on. And there's two possibilities, that it's an inflammatory process and that just looks bigger but there's less cancer. Or that the cancer grows for a while in some patients where their immune system was not that ready to attack. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards it kicks in and then the tumor responds. Right. Certainly we don't know what it is, but, uh, but 
you've, uh, you've reviewed some of the largest series. Now we had updates on uh, the pembrolizumab and nivolumab single agent. And, uh, right, and I think the clinical take home point is that there are a smaller percentage in the pembrolizumab and nivolumab patients who have this atypical response compared to ipilimumab, but there are patients who do have this delayed response. And so the clinical application of that is that the first you know, response assessment on imaging, if there's a very mild progression and the patient's clinically stable, you may continue to treat them for another three to four cycles and reassess their response at that time before making a decision. And it's a subtle decision making that is variable between patient to patient. Uh, the long-term follow-up that we had for both nivolumab and pembrolizumab with hundreds of patients, uh, again, confirmed what we know. These are very active drugs as single agents, very safe and tolerable. And in the first-line uh, treatment of patients with these agents, the response rates and complete response rates approach that of combination chuck plate point blockade as well. So that's very interesting to have. But overall, the these sort of progressions around 5% in this Much program. lower so than epilimumab. Yeah, so, yes. so it's, a, it's something to look for, but uh, the majority of patients will either respond or not respond, and then some, uh, a few are in between. But what we know, when we give the therapies, patients really respond uh, rapidly and without any doubts is that uh, the target therapies. And in this meeting, there was an important presentation by Georgina Long on the follow-up of one of the three randomized trials that have established that a combination of a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor that was better, better than a, than a BRAF inhibitor alone. Can you give yeah, us an Yeah, this to me was very exciting information. So this was the COMBI-D study, a randomized, very well conducted study of trametinib and uh, dibrafenib compared to single agent dibrafenib and placebo. So it was a placebo controlled study. And we saw finally what we've been waiting for, that there was clearly an overall survival advantage with the combination patients having an overall survival of 25 months compared to nine months or a little less than nine months in the single agent. And we had known, and, and this is an approved combination based on the higher response rates that we had seen and a very minimal difference in progression-free survival, but now we have the clear survival benefit that we had been waiting for in this well-conducted study. Um, again, with the toxicity, there was increased pyrexia in the combination, but overall, I think that the overall surva survival benefit is outstanding and it can be considered, you know, now we've had the approval, but now we have the confidence that this is really a regimen that patients can handle and uh, that can be considered for first line or second line for patients with BRAF mutation. And tying this mode of therapy with what we we're talking about, immunotherapy, before there was presentation of the first phase one clinical trial combining a PDL1 blocking antibody, uh, uh, um, the, the median uh, PDL1 antibody with the brafnib and trametinib, yes. so the BRAF and the MEK inhibitor. There's been other attempts of combining target BRAF target therapies with immunotherapies, and all of the presentations so far had uh, uh, questions about the safety of right. su such approach. But this one seems to be safe. There uh, was a phase one trial uh, where went up a very steep dose escalation, uh, and we have a series of, uh, uh, I think, 26 patients on a triple therapy with uh, uh, the PDL1 antibody, the brafnib and trametinib. And the side effects are what would be expected from the, the individual agents. And there was no unexpected side effect that was increased over what, should, what would be. Obviously, it's a small group of patients. But the response rate was 70%, uh, 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 which is not that different from what would be expected, but it's a very short follow-up. And what we need to know is, with time, are there more responses are turning, uh, 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 partial response, uh, well, stable diseases are turning to responses, are responses that are staying longer than we would be expected just from giving the, the, the targeted therapies alone. So I'm excited to, to know that we can actually, it's feasible and we can do this and we can put these two modes of therapy together. Yes, absolutely. That was a very nice early signal of response also with the combination, which is a strategy that a lot of clinical trials are moving to. So the shifting a little bit uh, to a more uh, to earlier disease, there was a, an important presentation about the management of, uh, surgical management of patients in regards to the sentinel lymph node. Uh, right. Tar and this may be one of the most practice changing presentations that was presented. So this was a well-designed randomized study of patients who were undergoing a sentinel lymph node biopsy 
and they were randomized to either uh, close observation following a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy or a completion lymph node dissection following the sentinel lymph node biopsy that was positive. As we know, with the prior MSLT1 study, there was no such randomization. The patients were automatically assigned to completion lymph node dissection. And the primary endpoint here was distant metastasis-free survival. And the outcome was that whether patients had the completion lymph node dissection or just the sentinel lymphadenectomy alone, there was no significant difference in distance-free uh, distant free dis metastasis free survival, nor was there any difference in overall survival. There was a small difference in regional recurrence, as you can imagine, in those small percentage that would have had an additional node. They would develop a regional recurrence, but those patients can often be cured by surgery. And so ultimately, there was no survival advantage or distant metastasis free survival advantage for doing the completion limb adenectomy. So this, of course, has huge practice implications. Um, a much larger randomized study is ongoing in the United States as well, which will test this same question called the MSLT2 study, and so we'll have additional information. But I think that we have to discuss with patients when we see them uh, whether or not the completion lymph node dissection is something that is going to benefit them, weighing the potential benefit and toxicity. Well, that's a certainly very important thing for patient management. Right. And, uh, we can conclude by highlighting some of the studies, the large studies that are, uh, that are ongoing that were highlighted in the Trials in Progress uh, um, uh, session. It was a poster session that uh, uh, ASCO has every year. And there's a, a large uh, adjuvant trial, uh, S1404, which is a SWOC uh, 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 ECOG trial open as a U.S. intergroup that uh, will, uh, is randomizing patients, or will start randomizing patients pretty soon. It's, uh, it's ready to be activated uh, between adjuvant high-dose interferon, which is our current standard, uh, compared to pembrolizumab uh, with uh, overall survival, relapse-free survival uh, 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 as primary endpoints. That's a 1,200 uh, patient trial, uh, and the, the, the primary investigator, the, the principal investigator is, uh, is Ken Grossman. He's been working with Amat Trahini from ECOC to advance this concept, and, uh, and uh, many other people have been involved. And we're excited to see that we can try to bring this, the benefit of PD-1 blockade early on and uh, test it prospectively. There's uh, another uh, uh, U.S. intergroup trial that I'd like to highlight, uh, S1320, uh, uh, which is led by Alan Algazi from UCSF. That's a study of continuous dosing with the brafenib trametinib versus a running of continuous dosing with intermittent dosing afterwards. Uh, the justification for this is that the uh, uh, our standard of care is giving continuously these uh, agents. But there's preclinical uh, information from, uh, from laboratory and mouse models that if you do intermittent therapy, the tumor is less able to adapt to the BRAF and MEK inhibitor blockade, and then it is less able to develop resistance, at least it, it delays resistance. So we're, we're testing this uh, prospectively. This is a study that's, a, that's accruing actively in many sites. I would encourage uh, uh, other people to open and, and to accrue to this, uh, to this study. Uh, the age, uh, both arms get the standard of care therapy. One is a little bit different than the other, so it's a, I, I think it's a, a very easy study to, to put patients on. And the last one I wanted to highlight is, uh, is an industry-sponsored study, of a, which is one of the few uh, phase threes that, uh, uh, that are ongoing right now in melanoma. There's, a, there's been a lot of them, but a lot of them have been reported in these uh, last several years and changed our, our practice. This is uh, the idea that if we could change tumors uh, to go from non-inflamed to inflamed by injecting a herpes virus called TBEC. And, uh, and then at the same time, take away the breaks of that immune system by, by, by giving a PD-1 antibody with pembrolizumab, and that's a randomized trial. Uh, that, it's been a phase one trial that has completed, and now it's becoming a, a, a large randomized trial open in many, many places. Right, and that was presented in the trials in progress session along with a lot of very interesting uh, combination studies that will have the results at the next year's meeting or even sooner. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think our field is now uh, 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 the success that we've had, it's becoming a, a standard of care and we're all centered into, can we, we have to do more, we have to understand more and 
and the ability to have uh, the, the combination of these agents is going to be very right. exciting in the next uh, in the next several years. And with standard of care, we think of clinical trials as standard of care too. With some of these very active agents, like you said, in combination can be considered standard of care for our patients as well. So from Chicago, we want to close this session of best of the day for melanoma.